The relationship between humans and animals has always been one with elements of conflict. But as the number of people on the planet continues to grow, it's becoming increasingly strained and imbalanced. With the world's human population approaching an extraordinary 8 billion, sprawling settlements and activities are encroaching on animal habitats more than ever. Scientists estimate humans are driving species extinction at around 1,000 times the natural rate, largely due to habitat loss and climate change. We urgently need to find better ways to live together on our shared planet. I'm Juliette Pearce and I'm here in Brisbane, Australia to see how a team of scientists and volunteers are helping koalas to survive the urban jungle. And I'm Russell Beard in Bangladesh where the locals are learning to coexist with their tiger neighbours. Queensland was once home to over one million koalas, but with a relentless pace of human expansion, their numbers have dropped by almost 80% since the 1990s, while the human population is still growing at 1,000 people per week. And that number is only set to grow, putting further pressures on surrounding wildlife. Without immediate intervention, koalas would face extinction. But a group of local residents and experts are trying to reverse this trend. The lush land that hugs Australia's east coast is one of the most desirable places for human settlement, but it's also prime koala habitat. As a result, increasing numbers of these marsupials are being forced to live within the city. John Hanger is a wildlife vet and founding member of the Koala Research Network. You brought me to this, an area that I would have thought you couldn't possibly have koalas because it's so busy. Mm. Why, why this area? This park really illustrates, I guess, in a really good way, how the, the, the threats that urban koalas are facing. They get killed Crossing. on the roads um, because often they cross at night when they're difficult to see and drivers just don't see them, so they'll often get killed on this road. In fact, this road is uh, uh, really a hot spot for koala deaths in the area, certainly when they get on the rail lines with a busy rail line where you've got trains running every couple of minutes, they're exposed to really significant injury and death, obviously. And so there's really a whole range of threats that they're exposed to in this sort of environment. Local experts like John are committed to protecting the koala before it's too late. But with their population scattered throughout the city, the first step to saving them is monitoring them. John and his team have been intensely studying a population in the Moreton Bay region of Brisbane. Today they're tracking by radio signal a pre-tagged koala named Sunny. So the guys are heading up the tree now, but we're going to be quiet to catch a, capture a koala so they can then check it out for the health check later on. Yep. Come back up. Don't let him out there. Oh, he's not distressed. Is he OK? Oh, look at him. Oh, that felt like a, <laughs> my heart pumping at that whole thing. Here he goes. OK, this is the food for the koala, just like this? Just like that, perfect. What, on top of his yep. head? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he's used to doing. We know him quite well. Sonny's a really nice little lad, so um, he's pretty calm. Now Sonny will head off to the vet where he will be screened for diseases. Koalas are currently listed as under threat. If nothing is done, they could be extinct in less than 50 years. The seriousness of the situation isn't lost on some local residents who are trying to tackle habitat erosion. Hi, Vanda. Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. 
What are you guys doing here today? Uh, I was just making sure that this little uh, stake had a marker in it so we know when to water. Okay. We're planting koala food trees here. Okay, being uh, eucalyptus? Yes. There are 200 species of, koala, of, of eucalypts in Queensland, but yeah. koalas eat only 22, so we right. have to be very specific, specific about what we plant. And why, how important is this work for the koala survival? Incredibly important, because this area will never be cleared yeah. for any sort of development. Mm -hmm. So we're surrounded, even though you can't see it, with high density urban development. So uh -huh. if we can increase the carrying capacity of this site for koalas, it will encourage them to move into here, which is much safer for them than out there. Just one koala can eat upwards of 500 leaves per day, moving from tree to tree. So they browse basically all day because eucalypts are fairly nutrient poor energy-wise. Mm, right. All right, so how many more trees have we got to do? Oh, a few, I think another three or four over there. Okay. Planting trees provides one solution for protecting the koala. But as urbanisation continues, roads and railway lines will inevitably expand, putting these animals in harm's way. Currently, up to 300 koalas are killed by vehicles here each year. But I'm meeting up with vet John again, who wants me to see an intervention which is making a difference at a railway line. It's essentially a water drainage culvert, but mm. there are a few additions. There's a post and rail to help the wildlife get off the ground. How do they know to use these culverts? Well, I guess initially they don't know, Juliet. They, they, they're they familiar with the habitat as it was, and when we put these impacts in and change the landscape, they have to learn to use it. Um, but the essential features really are that we, we put a koala-proof fence along the rail corridor, and that ensures that they don't go onto the rail corridor and get killed. Mm. And if they do work their way along the fence, ultimately they'll end up finding one or more of these culverts. And so with a bit of exploration, they'll, um, they'll often go through. To get an idea of how effective they are, John and the team have put up motion-sensitive cameras. And these, these show a range of, of wildlife using the culverts, including the koalas. Yeah, so here's a koala going into a group of culverts who explored a culvert but didn't go through it. And then we've got a, a group of kangaroos using it. A possum, another koala at a different culvert, and then coming out the other side is one of our koalas. Helping koalas navigate the urban jungle is essential to boosting their numbers, but the most significant factor in ensuring their survival is disease prevention. I'm back at the clinic where Sonny, the captured koala, is ready for his checkup. Vet Amy Robbins is about to give Sonny a sedative. This is just to settle him so he can, he can get his injection. Yeah, just lull him into a false sense of security. Yeah, yeah. trick him. <laughs> Something's about to happen, but you don't know it yet. <laughs> oh, what a good boy. What a brave little boy. Checking teeth. Yeah, and the colour of his gums and making sure he's got good um, refill time, which is a sense of how good his blood pressure is. And I have a look at the bladder. So this is obviously a big important thing for chlamydia. So you, it causes cystitis, so that causes inflammation of the, the bladder wall, I guess. Chlamydia has reached epidemic proportions amongst koalas in Australia, with over half the population infected. If left untreated, it can cause infertility, blindness and death. But generally, his blood is looking pretty healthy there. Good. Sunny is in the clear. Tell me about the significance of, you know, when you're testing f for chlamydia and, and the Morton Bay project. Disease has been shown that if you can control that one factor, then you can actually turn around declining populations. Mm. Um, so by going in there and um, doing the treatment and the vaccination against chlamydia, we've actually kind of turned that population around and it's on a um, trajectory for growth now. You know, it's phenomenal. We've never had such a big, significant project in koalas before, so it's really valuable scientifically. So now we're going to roll him over. And I'm going to he's waking up. Yeah, because he's waking up a little bit. OK. Before letting the koala recuperate, Amy fits another tracker collar. Yeah. 
It's now time for Sunny to be released. At John's study site, they've had some amazing results. The, the fact, I guess, that we can uh, not only make the individuals healthy, but the population's on a growth trajectory now, so it was on quite a steep um, downward decline towards extinction, and so now we're, we're getting around about 20% growth per annum, which is just an yeah. astounding turnaround, so amazing. very gratifying. You go that way. As the global population continues to grow, cities are sprawling further. More land is needed to grow food. More infrastructure is being built through fragile ecosystems. Take roads. Rampant road building over the last century has divided the earth into 600,000 fragments. Over half of these are less than one square kilometer, too small to support significant wildlife populations. With 25 million kilometers of new road expected by 2050, the struggle for animals to survive in the face of development will only get harder. Resolving these kinds of conservation conflicts is far from simple. The solutions that work best around the world are the one where local people have the ownership of the process of finding the solution. People need to be able to value the species that they are close to, and by value I mean perhaps culturally or spiritually, they want to have the species around. It requires inputs from all sorts of different areas of expertise. It's not a matter just for biologists. We need uh, social scientists, economists, people who would know how to work with poor communities. They all have to work together to figure out how to solve these conflicts. Just a century ago, there were thought to be over 100,000 tigers prowling Asia's swamps and jungles. But now numbers have declined by a staggering 98%. I'm heading to the Sundarban mangrove forest in western Bangladesh. It's one of the last remaining havens for the Bengal tiger. There's often conflict with local villagers who also depend on the forest for survival. I've come to meet a network of volunteers and conservationists who are coming together to try to stop the violence and save the tiger in the process. All right. Bangladesh's population has doubled from 80 to 160 million in just 40 years, forcing humans into what was once exclusively the tiger's terrain. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, you can see the, the Sundarbans just there over the water and this huge patches of forest right up against these villages. Here in Mongla, just on the edge of the national park, there really do seem to be people everywhere. It's hard to imagine that this area is home to tigers too, but it is, and that's where the conflict comes in. Conservationist Mahbub Alam runs Tiger Team, a network of volunteers dedicated to changing attitudes and reducing human tiger violence. How many tigers do you have here in the Sundarbans? We have 106. With the historical data, about two to three tigers killed by the local villagers every year. But if the, the total population is estimated just around 100, two to three starts to sound like a very big number. But 30 to 50 human killed every year. And uh, wow. um, around 50 30 to, to 50 a 50, year. 50, yeah, a year. And, uh, That's not just a little number. 30 to not, 50 a year. This is not a little number. I mean, like one a week. Can you talk to us about that interface? Like, how are they coming into contact with people here? And what's the result of that? In some areas uh, which don't uh, have that much of uh, geographical barrier in between forest and villages in that part of Sundarbon, uh, uh, yeah, tiger, uh, that comes out for the foods. 
uh, into the building. <laughs> Human-tiger interaction here is fraught with violence and fear. I'm on my way to a village right on the frontier of a conflict zone. So that edge that you can see there, that's actually the Sundarban forest right there. And there's nothing between the tiger habitat and the human habitat. And you can understand how scary it must be because everywhere you look, there's livestock, you know? And they, they build these fences, but I mean, they're just made of little sticks and very light gauze. Here, many have not just seen tigers from afar. They've had direct encounters with them. A local fisherman has a story to tell. Can you talk to us a bit about your experience here um, with the tigers? We must not do the Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you can see the little puncture marks where it's like, oh. what were you thinking when you were on the ground? Did you think, did you think you were going to die at that point? Sobahan escaped with his life, but those who don't leave behind families to fend for themselves. I've been told there are around a thousand women known as tiger widows in this region. I'm here to meet a lady called Rita, who lost her husband through a tiger attack 20 years ago. We know that the, the Sundarban forest is, is maybe just, you know, 100 yards away. Um, did you think of leaving? Like many people here, Rita prays to Bon Bibi before entering the forest to collect wood or honey. She's agreed to take me to meet her. So Bangladesh is obviously a Muslim country, but this is a Hindu region and uh, Hinduism being this pantheistic religion, many gods, this particular god is here to protect the people against attacks from the tiger. But it seems to me that Bombibi's help might not be enough. The fact is that the tiger's habitat is shrinking while the humans is expanding, pitting one against the other with disastrous results. As the predator at the top of the food chain, the tiger's role in the Sundarbans ecosystem is pivotal. If it becomes extinct, the whole system will collapse. To prevent unnecessary killings, Mabub and his team have pioneered an education program for local villages. His aim is to change attitudes towards tigers. I'm here in a community center in Joymoni, where the tiger scouts are having a lesson in what to do when a tiger enters the village. Uh, can, can I see how many people here have seen a tiger? Oh, really? Wow. And so why, can you tell me, why is it important to come here and learn about saving the tigers? Yeah. All right, guys, come on then. So, what this is the idea is that this is a pledge to save the tiger, I guess. So, we're not signing our name in blood, but in food coloring. 
Well done, high five, pink high fives, green high fives, all around. Well done, guys. You're doing good work. Outside the center, the community tiger response team have assembled. How on earth do you convince a bunch of people that it's a good idea to start chasing a wild tiger? Number one motivating factor for them to saving the tigers, because if they can save tiger, Shundurmurun will be saved and their livelihood will be ensured. <laughs> Did you uh, make the pledge? Yeah? Let me see your hands. No? You can have some of mine. Right, let's go. Right. <laughs> this may look a little unorthodox, but tigers are naturally solitary hunters only attacking isolated prey. Being surrounded by a group of chaotic orange colors making strange noises would be enough to scare them away. And as long as there's an escape route, a tiger will use it. That's amazing. And did you say there was 40 tigers that had been managed, you said? Yeah. So is that basically 40 tigers that you've ushered back into the, into the into forest? The... And so if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for you guys and doing what you're doing here and changing the kind of attitudes, do you think it's fair to say that those 40 tigers might be killed? Might be killed. That, those might be killed by the later villagers. All right. All right, so it looks like we're getting ready to move out. Um, I think the guys are going to go and do a bit of a patrol. Probably more of a training mission, but um, it doesn't hurt to take a stick just in case, right? OK. Cool. <laughs> They've got, they've got presents, I tell you that. That's great. The, the villagers are looking in like with admiration. That's great. So if 10 years ago a tiger came in here and he met you lot, would you have killed him? Uh, 10 years. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, yeah. uh, 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 Wild team is hot jagi the. Tokor amra, tokor amra nizid nizid dekhe amra kuch Jamra, parbo. Mamra peresi. A bakke se kore shunda bolte. Very very Felix. Very very Felix. Can I ask? Is it the same for all of you? Do you you feel the same? Yes. 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 I feel a lot safer with these guys around, even though we know there's wild tigers right there. But they're all positive about what they're doing. And, you know, maybe if uh, in the future communities or other countries can follow their good example, maybe there's hope for the tiger yet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Cheers, guys. Cheers, 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 cheers. Even with a growing human population and shrinking wilderness, there are ways that people and wildlife can coexist. In India, mobile phone technology is being used to warn workers of elephants passing through tea plantations. When they're spotted, an SMS alert is sent to everyone in the area, preventing surprise encounters. And in Kurdistan, locals who used to poach snow leopards now protect them in return for a lucrative business in snow leopard-friendly products. Further encroachment is inevitable, but if communities can learn to live alongside their animal neighbours, then it is possible to minimise the impact.